a number of really interesting questions on here. Great. <clears throat> Uh, keep them coming if you want to post questions. This is uh, the, the code for this one is fire hist, H I S T, QR code on your uh, agenda if you want to do that. Um, uh, it looks to me like the top question right now, I think, is probably for Mike. Are we on track with more mega fire? Are we on track for more mega fires? <laughs> Oh, man. Um, well, let's go back to fire as a chemical reaction. And um, if we're on track, I think that's forward looking, uh, thinking about what future conditions you know, might be. Uh, if you look into climate projections, you know, basically you can find any climate projection you want if you look at enough models. But most of them agree on temperature. A lot of them disagree on precipitation. Um, if you just say, okay, same precipitation, more temper higher temperature, then um, you're expecting the reaction to be more frequent. It's a basic kind of you know, laboratory reaction rate uh, result. And so um, whether that results in bigger fires is different than frequency. Um, so uh, whether, you know, the increased temperature expands the burn window, uh, allows the fuels to become drier than what we've seen. Um, you know, we're set up with a condition, assumingly that, you know, there could be big fires, <laughs> that's a given. Um, so have I talked myself into yes, maybe? Uh, I don't like to be a you know a doomsday person, but um, let's face it. I mean, trends are going that way. If you look at the Western data, if you look at Australian data, um, I'm not sure I've seen that effect in the Eastern U.S. Anybody know that? But I would say this is the place to be watching. Um, uh, and um, there are some interesting things going on. How many of you heard of the Anderson Creek fire in I think 2015? Anybody hear of that fire? It was, I think, the largest fire in 2015, burned 62 square miles of Kansas. Um, and there was another fire in, uh, I think it was 17, that burned out of Oklahoma into Kansas. Um, together, those equaled a million acres, but I don't hear anybody talking about it. So I would say if it happened in a more populous area that, were, that was affecting people, we would. But things are happening. We should probably be watching. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a dangerous place to live. We know that from history. Mike, to follow up to that, how do you think our, our settlements and roadways and the extensive network that we've built up in terms of infrastructure, how does that either positively or negatively influence that idea of the mega fire? I mean, obviously, out west, it's shown that if a fire gets big enough, it's going to roll through whatever infrastructure we've built anyway. But in an area like this, where the population centers are, um, we've had a long influence on infrastructure. How might that contribute? Well, I think that goes really well back to um, what Evan said, as well as some of the other studies I know of, is that um, in the modern record is that travel corridors are huge ignition lines. Um, you know, not only for, you know, accidental, uh, like <laughs> you're pulling a trailer and you're the chain is just dragging on the or you flip a cigarette or um you know recently in the eastern united states and in the, and in california you know a lot of power transmission goes down those um those ways and um some of that's getting you know old weak and some of these you know unique events or no one no people are there but our infrastructure is there in causing um you know very uncontrollable situations that we would have never thought about probably when it was done. So um, there are there there are good studies that show how roads and um, ignitions are related. So if you're looking for that kind of information, it's out there. Great. Uh, should the fire regime triangle be replaced with a square to include people? 
<laughs> Exclusion of people implies humans are alien visitors and not a part of nature. Uh, I've seen that. I've seen that square. I saw it a few weeks ago. Someone had a fire square in, you know, it, it was uh, you know, fuel, oxygen, and heat in humans. Um, but it doesn't take a human. It doesn't have to be a human, right? It could be lightning and burning coal veins and those types of things. Yeah, I think um, I really enjoy the spirit of that question. And the key piece is that, you know, when you're looking at the triangle, like where does the heat come from to, to cause that ignition? And I think what we're talking about is the source of ignition here, not necessarily if there is or isn't an ignition. So maybe it's one and the same. All right, thank you. Next question. Any correlation between the elevated impact or severity of tree pests and diseases, for example, spruce budworm, and the decrease of natural fires based on historic fire models? By the way, while they're thinking, uh, some of these are questions that others in the audience may be able to answer. If you're on here, and I know many of you are, uh, go ahead and respond to a question by all means. You don't have to have the definitive answer, but um, we can get some good conversations going there too and sharing by others than these two. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd be happy to ramble on with my Don't ramble too long. Thoughts on that, more good but I, I think there's probably other people here who know more about that than I do. <laughs> Anybody want the microphone? Well, I mean, I, I can answer some of that question. So I, uh, can you all hear me? Uh, not in the other room. Oh, okay, sorry about that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I can answer some of that question because I did look at that through simulation experiments. And so, I mean, we do know from at least if you do that, um, that spruce budworm can make severity worse. But if you didn't have spruce budworm here, you wouldn't have the natural cooling agent that it provided. So if we didn't have spruce budworm here, we'd have a hell of a lot more spruce and fir. So when you do the balance of that over time, it actually decreases the amount of great extent. Thanks, Brian. Sure. Uh, we owe it to our, this is a part comment, part question. We owe it to our shared cultural heritage to restore cultural burn impacts to the landscape. But how do we sell the idea to today's post-smoky culture? Are we at a post-smoky? Um, this would be time for that joke we were talking about. Okay. Um, so I think that that's a really, I, I think that's a great question. And um, I feel like my background is in physical science. I've done a lot of training work for my career. And I really feel like the last couple of years, I have been pulled more and more into the social aspects of the work that we're doing. Um, and the, that side of it is gonna be really important moving forward. Um, one of the pieces that I'm really curious about as we talk about you know, potentially advocating for active fire management in wilderness settings, um, a lot of times that sets a lot of people on edge um, because you could argue that it's a slippery slope, um, but it quickly goes to the, the social justice aspects of wilderness um, and whether it, it should exist in the way that we conceptualize it. Um, and so there's a lot of really good conversation there, but that's a societal level piece. Um, Two, I don't want to say two things. Uh, one is that um, everyone's fascinated with fire. You know, we all gather around fires and we stare it off and we go into some other world. And uh, the public is that way. And um, everyone loves a good fire story. And uh, the stories that I've been told from um, Native people about how in tune they were with their environment through fire literally sent chills up my body. I mean, and I'm not gonna share the ones I've heard because I feel like, you know, I don't have permission to, but it is insane. It's something that you learn through your people living on a place over a thousand or more years. And we're not in tune that way, I'm sorry. Um, the second thing I think is a very a problematic um, you know, a threshold we have to cross is that, in my opinion, um, 
uh, in, we're moving forward in a totally different world. And historically, if people were burning, they were burning for a list of reasons, okay? And let's just say there were 20, that's what they come up with, like 17 or 20 major reasons why Native Americans were burning, okay? And then here we are today with that same land. That list of reasons is not our reasons today. Some of them are, some of them are not. And what we need from that land is not, in my opinion, probably the same. And so we, we need to, I think, address that question is what are, what are our values and does burning produce that? If not, you know, history may not have any relevance on the future. Well, on that note, um, how do you account for, uh, actually, I'm going to go to the next one. We have a tie here. What efforts are you or those collecting this data taking to ensure that indigenous voices are heard? Um, that's a great question. Um, there are, <clears throat> there are a lot of conversations happening and that's a really important place, um, to start. Um, I know that, um, the pace of this project isn't necessarily going at the same pace that a normal, um, scientific study conducted in a university setting would occur in. And, um, part of the group with Robin, um, that I'm working with, uh, there are several members of indigenous communities that are on that, that collaborative team and case in point last summer, we went and we spent a week up on La Croix, um, in the community meeting and talking and, and there are numerous experiences in there that, that really changed the shape of the whole project and realized how much we have to learn on the side of researchers to, to do this well and do it in a good way. Um, so I would say that there are a lot of people across a lot of different areas of work that are engaged on it and I feel like the people that we're working with right now are sincerely engaged and it feels like we're building good relationships. So I don't know if that answers the question. I will say that I think that's, uh, something that we'll work a little bit harder to do. I, I, um, I think that uh, we probably should have those voices more prominently here among uh, our group. So uh, but I will also, I'll throw in, Kurt is hopefully helping um, Leech Lake Tribal College uh, put in a dendro lab and um, having students involved in that so that essentially that, you know, they can do fire history work and start recovering some of these stories um, themselves. Yeah, there's a, there's another question to the effect, uh, you know, do you believe indigenous people should be the ones telling a part of the story? And I think, uh, yeah, I think so. I think that's something we'll do uh, a better job of next time. Um, I am interested in this question. Uh, can field staff report remote locations of significant fire scars to the system and have it plotted on the map? Is there a way in this era of citizen science? Is there a way to do that? Absolutely. Yeah, report it. To whom? How, how do they do it? <laughs> <laughs> report, yeah. So, okay, so it was actually driving up here when I was on sabbatical starting the Boundary Waters, and Kurt and I were coming to scout fire scars in the part of Wisconsin and had this huge brainstorm about a citizen science project, web based, you know, lat long photos, descriptions, so they could be incorporated in. Never happened, but. <laughs> If any of you are savvy in such ways and have the time and interest, I think that that would be a wonderful component. Um, the maps we've shown are built off of databases our labs maintain. The larger network is something that a um, person named Ellis Margolis is working on from the UFGS. Um, it's absolutely a necessary part of this. Um, I'm speaking at a DNR workshop in Wisconsin, and we're gonna go through a session on training, like in terms of field ID and, and discussion on how do we start sharing this information? Because there's so many of you that are on the ground in the woods that have eyes in places that, you know, that are a key part of this whole thing. And so to have an opportunity for you to share that expertise would be awesome. Um, 
I don't think it exists. As Kyle just position. pointed out, these guys have email addresses and <laughs> uh, they, those are listed in our program. And I would encourage you, whether they would encourage you or not, uh, reach out to them and, Always and share email. those. Uh, and with that, we have a number of other good questions. This is really not an adequate amount of time for this discussion, but what a great uh, set of presentations. Thank you very much. We always struggle to balance, Evan, this is yours, thank you. We struggle to balance uh, hearing from speakers uh, with really engaging in conversation. And I, I too bad, I think so far, um, we haven't had as much conversation as, as we might ideally have. But thank you all for submitting these questions. They're really uh, great. And let's keep doing that. Uh, we're gonna move next to Lee.